gonna finish off the video series uh, for biochemistry with this video on inborn errors of metabolism. So inborn errors of metabolism. Inborn because they're inherited from their parents. Errors meaning there's either the enzyme is not there or the enzyme is defective. Metabolism meaning any of the metabolic processes that we've talked about. More specifically we're going to talk about nitrogen uh, metabolism but Van Gierke's disease, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, all of those would be considered inborn errors of metabolism. So what we're going to start with is one known as maple syrup urine disease. So maple syrup urine disease presents as you would expect um, it has, you know, very th a thicker urine. Smells kind of like maple syrup. We'll 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 look at the two things that are dumped into the urine um, to cause that. Um, the three amino acids we're going to look specifically at with this disease is leucine, valine, and isoleucine. So leucine, valine, and isoleucine are all known as branched chain amino acids. And so these branched chain amino acids are not metabolized like the other uh, amino acids are um, for a variety of reasons. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at how these amino acids are metabolized and then where we break that pathway for maple syrup urine disease and then how we treat it. So, let's get a different color. Here we have an amino acid. So again, this is for leucine, valine, or isoleucine. I'm going to show this one. So there's leucine. So leucine... goes through an enzyme known as branched chain amino transferase. So we've seen this before. We've seen an amino transferase before. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use alpha ketoglutarate so alpha-ketoglutarate is one of those intermediates in the citric acid cycle as well as in nitrogen metabolism that's very, very important. And so without it, we would be in trouble. So alpha-ketoglutarate is going to come through here, this reaction, and we're going to make glutamate. So just like we did with the ammonium pathway um, outside of the nucleus, to bring it, or outside of the mitochondria, to bring it into the mitochondria. And so from leucine, after this reaction, we're going to make, that's a terrible look and see, we're going to make this. Again, mechanism doesn't matter. So what we've done is we've removed the ammonia or the nitrogen containing group. We've done a few other things like we've oxidized the alpha carbon but this is alpha keto right because I'm circling the alpha carbon in red so this is alpha keto iso caproate so alpha keto isocaproate. This is the first step in branched chain amino acid metabolism. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase the lep the arrow and then the leucine because we have one more step and it goes from the alpha keto isocaproate through one more enzyme. Yeah. Thought I could keep that arrow. So I'm going to just reverse this arrow. So from alpha keto isocaproate we're actually going to add coash to it. And what we do it or this enzyme is the branched chain oxidative decarboxylase and so since it's a decarboxylase not only do we get coash in we're gonna get CO2 out and you can kind of imagine with the carbon where we're going to add that coash again mechanism is not important but you should just start to picture uh, you should be able to look at a molecule and say oh I think that's where it will attach and if you've predicted the alpha carbon you would be correct and we get this this is iso valeryl coa Right, so isovaleryl CoA. So we said branch chain amino acids. The once we remove the nitrogen group, then the rest of the backbone goes off in a variety of different ways into a variety of different metabolic pathways. So maple syrup urine disease is broken. I'll do it in red to denote a break. Right here. So people who have maple syrup urine disease are defective in their branch chain oxidative decarboxylase. And so if you're defective here, so this is a key thought, a key theme for these inborn er errors of metabolism and just overall generally. If you break a pathway, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is you're going to get an increase in whatever is upstream of that break. So here we have alpha keto isocaproate. You're also going to get an increase of leucine. Well, that's not right. Of leucine, valine, isoleucine, right? You're going to get an increase of those because they're not going to be able to process all the way through the pathway to get to isovaleryl CoA. And so when you have a, a bunch of leucine, valine, isoleucine, or alpha keto isocaproate, all of those things are accumulated and dumped into your blood, and then they're dumped into your urine. And so, if you're a ba so when you have a baby born, they usually take blood tests right away because um, it takes a couple weeks to actually get the results back for these diseases, for these inborn errors in metabolism, because we know the intermediates that are going to be present. So untreated. So let's say we have this disease untreated. It will lead to mental retardation. So, 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 so what we'll see is with a lot of these inborn errors of metabolism, they, they have defects in the brain, right? Defects in thoughts, defects in, in, in intelligence, um, defects in development. Uh, and, and the reason is because a lot of these intermediates can be toxic. Um, so the treatment for this is just to decrease your branch chain amino acids, right? Your leucine, valine, isoleucine. You just don't eat them and you'll be fine. Um, and so that's maple syrup urine disease. The next one we're going to talk about is phenylketonuria, also known as PKU. You guys have probably are familiar with PKU, or, or at least have heard of it uh, once before. And so what we have 
is I'm going to draw phenylalanine a little different. I don't know why I'm going to do this. I'm just going to do it. Right, so there's phenylalanine. Phenylalanine has a protein that uses oxygen. It's called phenylalanine hydroxylase. Phenylalanine hydroxylase is also known as PAH. Now, We'll, we'll talk about pH in a minute. So what phenylalanine hydroxylase does is we take phenylalanine and we change it with a simple modification. At least simple to draw. We hydroxylate the phenyl ring or the benzene ring. Now if you if you remember back to organic chemistry it's very hard to do this type of uh, chemistry. Usually you see this chemistry done in proteins known as P450s. Right? That's just a class of enzyme that usually does this type of chemistry. What's interesting about P450s is that they actually have iron or another metal in their active site. PAH, surprisingly, doesn't. It has this. Tetrahydrobiopterin. Right, so it's non-heme. There's no iron. This is very unique to do this type of chemistry in the absence of iron or, or another metal. And so PKU takes phenylalanine, turns it into tyrosine through phenylalanine hydroxylase. Tyrosine will then go on, depending on the type of cell that it's in, to make you know dopamine, serotonin, uh, melanin, your you know your melanocytes, melanin, uh, those pigment molecules. So in PKU patients, so we'll get rid of that. So you should be familiar that phenylalanine hydroxylase does this type of, or PAH, does this type of chemistry in the absence of iron. Um, so in PKU patients, we're missing that. So you don't have, or it's defective in PKU patients, so you don't have phenylalanine hydroxylase. In that case, what happens, again, we'll accumulate phenylalanine, and if we're going to accumulate phenylalanine, we're going to accumulate a lot of nitrogen. And so, here comes our friend, alpha-ketoglutarate. We're going to make glutamate. Right, and this is going to be phenylalanine. I just don't have enough room to draw it, or to write it. Phenylalanine aminotransferase. And if you remember from the very first day we talked about this, when an amino acid removes the nitrogen group, we make an alpha keto acid. So the thing that we make is this. So we make an alpha keto acid. This we've seen before. That we've seen before. That's pyruvate. So the molecule that we make is known as phenyl pyruvate. So if we were to let PKU be undiagnosed, this molecule would be about 20 times increased than what it normally is in our blood in, in patients without PKU. 
And so it builds up in the blood. It's about 20 times more than normal. So why is phenylpyruvate so bad? Because, I'll circle it again, and I'll circle it this time. That's pyruvate. Pyruvate dehydrogenase complex sees that and thinks, ooh, pyruvate. I'm going to make some acetyl-CoA. But there's one bad portion to phenylpyruvate, and that's this right here. So what happens is phenylpyruvate gets into your PDH, or your pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and it just mucks it up, right? It, it, it just sticks there. It can't work. And so thereby inhibiting your uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So let's talk about PKU, its treatment, what happens if we don't treat it, and a lot of things with it. So, treatment for PKU. We, we saw in class, and if you have a stick of, or a pack of gum, you should look at the back of it, and usually it says phenylketonureix. This product contains phenylalanine. Um, pretty much don't chew it. So it's a low phenylalanine diet. Low phenylalanine diet. Now, if you notice something, phenylalanine is unfortunately a required amino acid, right? We need it in our diet because we can't make it ourselves. And so it's, it's a very fine line on how much a person with PKU can have. So untreated, untreated, your, the IQ of somebody untreated is about 53. Right, so again, leading to mental retardation. Um, if you treat it, it'll go up to about 93, which is pretty normal. And so with treatment, it, it helps. Um, half of the people with this, if they're untreated, will die by 20. Three quarters by 30. And so what are some of the symptoms, right? So with maple syrup urine disease, it's pretty self-explanatory in the name. With PKU, um, you get a decreased brain weight. So the brain is below a normal weight of what it should be. Um, you're usually very hyper, hyperactivity. And then the one cause, and this is why I brought up in class the madness of King George, why they think King George had PKU, is because your urine turns green or a greenish color, and the reason why is because in urine you have FeCl3. And when FeCl3 gets exposed to the air, it gets reduced, turning it green. And so an interesting fact is that about 1% of all of, of in mental institution patients patients have PKU. And that was not diagnosed early and then has led to, to where they are now. You know, that's not saying everybody is. And again, this is something where babies nowadays are, are constantly treated or, or constantly tested for this. And so, the last thing we're going to cover in this video and then we're going to cover at least with regards to nitrogen. And so we're talking about proteins and amino acids. Well, proteins are these huge things. We've just been talking about amino acids. How do those huge proteins become amino acids? So, we eat proteins. I will not be drawing a fancy face. So, dietary proteins enter into our mouth, and they experience things called proteolytic enzymes. We've talked about these. Chymotrypsin, trypsinogen, or trypsin, sorry, chymotrypsin, all those other enzymes that we talked about. Proteolytic enzymes are going to cut things up. So some of these enzymes can digest these proteins to the amino acids, to their individual amino acids. Some of them can't, but can make oligopeptides. Right? So these are shorter segments of uh, amino acids, usually between, I don't know, 10 or so. And so this is in the lumen 
of the small intestine, but, and so if that's the lumen, this is the blood, the blood vessels, right? And so amino acids can go through the lumen into the blood to be degraded into other things, or, or, or to, be, to be used for different purposes. Oligopeptides, however, cannot be. Oligopeptides are too big to go through the, the lumen wall, and so what ends up happening is these oligopeptides get turned into amino acids through something known as amino peptidase, peptidase, which is this box right here. Now, not all of the oligopeptides get turned into amino acids. Some of them can enter in through di or tripeptides, but that's the limit. Two or three amino acids. And then there are other peptidases, not necessarily this amino peptidase, but there are other peptidases in our blood, in our body, that sees these and will attack them, making them into individual amino acids, right? So we want to get it down to the individual amino acids. For us to use in protein uh, synthesis, as well as us to use in nitrogen and for energy. So that's dietary proteins. So how does our cell degrade our own body's proteins, right? So we make proteins all the time. You know, we have nuclear proteins, we have cytoplasmic proteins. How does our body take care of those proteins? It's known as the 26S proteasome. Or the 26S proteasome pathway. And the thing that's very important is about a 76 amino acid little protein tag, kind of like, remember we talked about tags or tagging proteins in, in lab, um, and we said, you know, these tags can, you know, we, we can use them to purify proteins. They can also be used to tag proteins for destruction. And this is ubiquitin, right, ubiquitilation. So, how does this pathway work? Well, let's look at ubiquitin. Here's ubiquitin. Ubiquitin has to be activated before it can be placed onto a protein. The activation enzyme is known as E1. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take ATP and we're going to get a pyrophosphate back. And so now we're going to have ubiquitin, C, double bonded O, bonded to, whoa, and A, M, P. We've seen that before. So this is all, this is all in E1. So what's actually going to happen is we do that, right, to make it a better leaving group. E1 is going to come in. Oh, come on. E1 is going to come in and actually bind itself to the ubiquitin. And so what we get is our E1 enzyme. I'm going to do this in a different color. I'll do it in purple. Go crew. E1 enzyme through a sulfur is going to be bound. I'll keep that in black. Is going to be bound to our ubiquitin. And so what's going to happen is, so now it's charged. Now it's ready. So what's going to happen is an E2 enzyme is going to come in and kick off the E1. We're not going to worry about the transfer. We're not going to worry about how this occurs. All we're going to worry about is now... We've got a different enzyme, E2, 
is now bound to the same sulfur linkage to our ubiquitin. Now we're ready to ubiqu what's known as ubiquitolate or ubiquitinate depending on where you read our protein. And so I'm going to erase this stuff up here so we can have a little bit of room to draw this. So there's going to be another protein that comes in, except we're not going to kick off this ubiquitin from the E2, but it's E3. So you have E1 to charge the ubiquitin, E1 transfers it to E2, E2 then meets up with an E3, so what E3, let me draw it up here, is kind of like a bridge. So what E3 does, and this is very important for cell cycle regulation. So what E3, do, E3 does is it there's the E2, I know I drew it a little bit differently than I did down there. E2 recognizes the E3. So I guess E3. E2 recognizes the E3. And S bonded to C bonded to ubiquitin, which is double bonded to O. What E3 does is it brings together the protein that's supposed to be degraded. And so one, whoops, nope, cancel. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Four, and then NH3 plus the lysine groups this is usually occurs in lysines lysines only so ubiquitin on lysines only right so, so we can ubiquitolate lysines but what E3 does is it brings the E2 really close to the to the lysine and then what happens is chemistry. Since we put these two things together, what we get E2, E3 fall off, and what we're left with is this. Our protein so we've got one, two, three, four, five, but N H bonded to a C, double bonded to an O, bonded to a ubiquitin. So E2, E3 fall off. Now this process can be repeated. So there in on ubiquitin, there is a high amount of lysines. And so what happens is, is another E2 comes in with another ubiquitin, and E3 brings them to together. Another ubiquitin is added, and another, and another, and another. And this is a signal for the cell to say, hey, we need to degrade this protein because we, we need to get rid of it. It's no longer good. We no longer need it. Or during the cell cycle, it's like, hey, we need a transition. So... This is the ubiquitin cell. So this is really everything that we're going to cover with regards to nitrogen. If you have any questions on this, especially this last part with ubiquitolation, please come see me. Um, I'd be willing to talk about it um, because it is a little diluted, right? That, that you can get into the weeds with it. Um, so please be sure to, to, to come see me if you have any questions. Remember, on Monday, we're going to watch a video Another, or a movie, we're actually going to watch a movie, and you guys will have questions to fill out about it. In the morning sun, I'll be sitting when the evening comes, yeah. watching the shears roll in, and I'm watching roll